Realizing a New Train of Thought, Essay 8, History of Economy. Quote, it is a telling symptom of our condition that no established school, discipline, or general theory of social analysis has grounded itself in life requirements. Instead, some social construct is invariably adopted as the ultimate reference, body, set of ideas, the state, the market, a class, technological development, or some other factor than the life ground itself. End quote. John McMurtry. Overview. Economics is likely the most critical, relevant, and influential societal characteristic there is. Virtually every aspect of our lives, often without conscious recognition, has a relationship to the historical development and present practice of economic thought on one level or another. Molding our most basic social institutions, core beliefs and values. In fact, the very essence of how we as a society think about our relationship to each other and the habitat that supports us is in large part a direct result of the economic theories and practices we perpetuate. Thoughtful review of historical, religious, and moral philosophies, governmental development, political parties, legal statutes, and other social contracts and beliefs that compromise that comprise a given social system and its culture reveal the deep impact economic assumptions have and continue to have in shaping of the zeitgeist of a time. Slavery, classism, xenophobia, racism, sexism, subjugation, and many other divisive and exploitative notions still common to human cultural history will be found to have kernels of origin or perpetuation in many generally accepted economic philosophies to one degree or another. History is fairly clear with respect to how the social condition is groomed by the prevailing economic assumptions of a given period, and this broad sociological consideration is sadly not given much gravity in the world today when thinking about why the world is the way it is and why we think the way we do. As a preliminary point, a point which will reemerge later in this essay, there has commonly been a duality noted in most modern economic thought, where the capitalist free market, meaning the free action of independent producers, laborer and traders, working in aggregate to buy, sell, and employ, is to be contrasted to that of the state, meaning a unified system of delegated power that has the capacity to set legal policy and economic mandates that can inhibit the actions of the free market through interference. Most economic debates today revolved around this duality on one level or another with the laissez-faire interests or those who wish to have a completely non-regulated market economy constantly at war with the statists or those who think some kind of centralized government control and decision-making over economic planning and policy is best. The Zeitgeist Movement takes neither side, even though many who hear Tzium's proposals have a knee-jerk reaction to assume the latter association, statism. As with many traditionalized belief systems, polarized perspectives and defenses are common, and the idea that there is no other possible frame of reference with respect to how an economic system can be developed and administered is to close oneself off dogmatically to many relevant and emerging considerations. The following brief treatment is about the historical development of economics. We will trace the general history of economic thought from roughly the 17th century onward, highlighting the core influences that gave birth to the modern free market capitalist system. However, as will be expanded upon more so in part three, a different perspective will also be alluded to. We will call this the mechanistic view. The mechanistic perspective of economic factoring takes a different look at the causal scientific realities of human existence and our habitat and builds a model of economic theory from the standpoint of strategic reason, not historical tradition. The bottom line is that modern economic thought is really not modern at all, and the vast majority of assumptions still held as given, such as property, 
money, classism, theories of value, capital, and other concepts that run through virtually all contextually relevant historical arguments are really outdated in their underlying premises. Rapid development in the industrial, informational, and human sciences, which have gone largely ignored by the established economic tradition, are posing critical reconsiderations and new relationships with, which simply do not exist in the traditional models. With respect to the ever mutating schools of thought that have brought the economic debate to where it rests today, the academic, often formulaic, traditionalized evolution of established economic theory and practice appears to have developed a self-referring frame of reference. In other words, the most common mainstream economic considerations discussed, accepted today, those most propagated in the prestigious academic schools and governmental conferences, will be found to derive their importance from the mere fact that they have been considered important for so long. As a metaphor, it is similar to viewing the engine of an automobile and assuming the overall structure of that engine is immutable and only variation among existing component parts is possible, as opposed to the radical idea of redesigning the entire engine structure from the ground up, perhaps based upon new technology and information that serves the utility more efficiently and successfully. Modern economic thought and practice is an old engine with generations of imminent experts working to administer old components parts refusing to accept the possibility that the entire engine is outdated and perhaps increasingly detrimental. They continue to publish arguments, theories, and equations that reinforce the false importance of that old engine, old frame of reference, ignoring new advents in science, technology, and public health that contradict their traditionalism. It is no different than the long history of other established ideas such as abject human slavery, where the society at large really didn't question the practice and considered such established structures imposed and codified as natural to the human condition. Underlying themes. Taking an historical perspective Europe of the Middle Ages is generally a decent ideological starting point, as the most central ideas characteristic of modern capitalism, which later spread across the world, appear to have taken hold during this period. It is from the 17th century onward that we find most of the influential philosophers, highly regarded today in traditional history books of economics. While historians have found that the basic gestures of property and the act of trading for profit go back to the second millennium BC, its core developmental foundation and institutionalization appears to rest around the late feudal early merc mercantilist periods. Rather than discuss the various differences between the socioeconomic systems that preceded modern capitalism, it is more worthwhile to note the general similarities. In this broad context, the capitalist system appears to be a manifest evolution of what are mostly deeply ingrained historical assumptions of human nature and human social relations. Firstly, it will be noticed throughout this evolution that a class divide has been recognized and employed to one degree or another. People have generally been divided into two groups those that produce for minimal reward and those who gain from that production. From ancient Egyptian slavery to the peasant farmer toiling in subsistence for his lord in medieval feudalism to the codified oppression of the market merchants by the state monopolies of mercantilism, the theme of inequality has been very clear and consistent. A second feature held in common to these dominant Western socioeconomic philosophies is that of a basic disregard or perhaps ignorance of critical relationships between the human species and its governing supportive habitat. While certain exceptions can be found with indigenous tribes such as with pre-colonial Native American societies, Western economic thought has been almost devoid of such considerations 
absent the more recent and mounting ecological problems which have forced some public government response and a very general interest in reform. A third and final broad feature to note is the general dismissal of the social recognition of a person's well-being on the level of human need and hence public health. Advancements in the human sciences, which occurred largely after the core doctrines of economic thought, were traditionally codified, have found that human wants and human needs are not the same, and the deprivation of the latter can create many negative consequences, not only for the individual, but for the society itself. Antisocial, criminal, and violent behavior, for example, have been found sourced to many forms of social deprivation rooted in the socioeconomic tradition. Put more generally, the system ignores such social consequences by design, relegating these outcomes as mere externalities in most cases. This reality was further compounded in the 18th century where the socially Darwinistic undertones of the labor for reward premise increasingly reduced the human being to an object that was to be defined and qualified by his or her contribution to the system of labor. If the average person is unable to obtain labor or engage successfully in the market economy, there exists no real safeguard with respect to one's survival or well-being, except for interference coming from the state in the form of welfare. In the modern day, this reality is of great controversy, where the claim of socialism has become a knee-jerk condemnation reaction whenever governmental policy attempts to provide direct support for a citizenry without full use of the market mechanism. Dawn of Market Capitalism Medieval feudalism, roughly from the 9th to the 16th centuries, was the dominant socioeconomic system that essentially preceded free market capitalism in Western Europe with what was later to be called mercantilism, serving as what could be considered a transition stage. Feudalism was based on a system of mutual obligations and services going up and down a set social hierarchy, with the entire social system resting essentially on an agricultural foundation. Medieval society was mostly an agrarian society, and the social hierarchy was based essentially on people's ties to land. The basic economic institutions were the guilds, and if someone wanted to produce or sell a good or service, they would generally join a guild. A great deal could be stated in detail about this extensive period of history, and as with most history, it is subject to various interpretations and debate. However, for the sake of this essay, we will only present a very general overview with respect to the economic transition to market capitalism. As agriculture as agricultural and transport technology improved, the expansion of trade occurred by the 13th century with the advent of the four-wheeled wagon, for example. The range of market interaction rapidly increased. Likewise, increased labor specialization, urban concentrations, and population growth also occurred. These changes coupled with the resulting increasing power of the merchant capitalists, as they could be called, slowly weakened the traditional, customary ties that held the feudal social structure together. Over time, more complex cities began to emerge, which were successful in obtaining independence from the feudal lords, and increasingly complex systems of exchange, credit, and law began to emerge, many of which are found to mirror many basic aspects of modern capitalism. In the customary feudal system, Generally, the handicraft producer was also the seller to the buyer of use. However, as the evolution of the market continued around these new urban centers, the craftsmen began to sell at a discount in mass to non-producing merchants who, re who would resell in distant markets for a profit, another feature later to be held common to market capitalism. By the 16th century, the handicraft industry, common to feudalism, had been transformed into a crude mirror of what we know today, with the outsourcing of labor, singular ownership of production, along with many finding themselves more and more in the position of being employed rather than producing themselves, 
Eventually, the logic surrounding monetary profit began to be the core deciding factor of overall action in a systemic way, and the true seeds of capitalism took root. Mercantilism, which essentially dominated Western Europe, <clears throat> Western European ec economic policy from the 16th to the late 18th centuries, was characterized by state-driven trade monopolies to ensure a positive balance of trade. Coupled with many other extensive regulations for production, wages, and commerce emerging over time, further increasing the power of the state. Collusion between the state and these emerging industries were common, and many wars occurred due to these practices, since it was based on trade restrictions between nations that often took the effect of economic warfare. Adam Smith, who will be discussed later in this essay, wrote an extensive criticism of mercantilism in his classic 1776 text, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. It is here where it could be declared that the ideological birth of free market capitalism really took root in theory with the rejection of what is often called state capitalism in modern terms, where the state interferes with the freedom of the market, a defining feature of mercantilism. Today, capitalism as a singular term is generally defined culturally in the theoretical context of free market not state capitalism, although many will argue in great detail as to which type of system we really have today, among other variations of the term. In reality, there is no pure free market or state-based system in existence, but a complex fusion between the two, generally speaking. Again, as noted at the beginning of this essay, the vast majority of economic debates and blame regarding economic unfolding often revolve around these polarized ideas. Capitalism defined. Capitalism as we know it in specifics today, including not only its economic theory, but powerful political and social effects, emerged in form, as noted, rather slowly over a period of several centuries. It should be stated up front that there is no complete agreement amongst economic historians and theorists as to what the essential features of capitalism really are. We will, however, reduce its historical characterization, which some will likely find debatable, to four basic features. 1. Market-based production and distribution. Commodity production is based around rather complex interrelationships and dependencies that do not involve direct personal interactions between pro producers and consumers. Supply and demand is mediated by the market system. 2. Private ownership of production means. This means that society grants to private persons the right to dictate how the raw materials, tools, machinery, and buildings necessary for production can be used. 3. Decoupling of ownership and labor. In short, a constant class divide is inherent where on the top level, capitalists, by historical definition, own the means of production, but yet have no obligation to contribute to production itself. The capitalist owns everything produced by the laborers, who only own their own labor by legal authority. And four, self-maximizing incentive assumed. Individualistic, competitive, and acquisitive interests are necessary for the successful functioning of capitalism, since a constant pressure to consume and expand is needed to avoid recessions, depressions, and other negatives. In many ways, this is the rational behavioral view held where if all humans acted in a certain assumed way, the system would function without inhibition. Locke, Evolution of Property. A deep philosophical undercurrent to the capitalist system is the notion of property. English philosopher John Locke is a pivotal figure, also sourced in Adam Smith's more influential Wealth of Nations. Locke not only defines the idea in general, he presents a subtle yet powerful contradiction. In Chapter 5, entitled Property of Locke's Second Treatise of Government, published in 1689, 
He poses an argument with respect to the nature of property and its appropriation. He states, the labor of his body and the work of his hands, we may say, are strictly his. So when he takes something from the state that nature has provided and left it in, he mixes his labor with it, thus joining to it something that is his own, and in that way he makes it his property. This statement, supporting in gesture what was later to associate with the labor theory of value, proposes the logic that since labor is owned by the laborer, since he owns himself, any energy expelled through his labor transfers that ownership to the product made. His philosophical disposition is essentially derived from a Christian perspective, stating, God gave the world to men in common, but since he gave it to them for their benefit and for the greatest conveniences of life they could get from it, he can't have meant it always to remain common and uncultivated. Given this declaration of the common nature of the earth and its fruits to all of humanity before its cultivation via appropriation in the form of property, he also derives that owners are required to not allow anything to spoil. Nothing was made by God for man to spoil or destroy, and they must leave enough for others. This appropriation of a plot of land by improving it wasn't done at the expense of any other man because there was still enough, and as good, left for others. <clears throat> These values in simplistic form seem socially justifiable in general. He makes it clear up until this point that the ownership context is relevant only insofar as the owner's needs and ability to cultivate or produce. However, in section 36, he reveals a unique reality, the implications of which Locke likely did not anticipate and, in many ways, nullifies all prior arguments in his defense of private property. He states, the one thing that blocks this is the invention of money and men's tacit agreement to put a value on it. This made it possible with men's consent to have larger possessions and to have a right to them. Now in effect, his original premise summarized in part here that anyone can through his labor come to own as much as he can use in a beneficial way before it spoils. Anything beyond this is more than his share and belongs to others becomes very difficult to, to defend as money now not only allows men to have larger possessions, implicitly voiding in context the idea that anything beyond this is more than his share and belongs to others. It also further implies that money can buy labor, which voids the idea that he, in this case the buyer, mixes his labor with it, thus joining to it something that is his own, and in that way he makes it his property. Finally, the proviso. Nothing was made by God for man to spoil or destroy is nullified with a new association that money, being gold or silver at that time, simply cannot spoil. That is how money came into use, as a durable thing that men could keep without its spoiling, and that by mutual consent men would take in exchange for the truly useful but perishable supports of life. It is here where we find, at least in the medium of literary discourse, the true seed of capitalist ownership justification, where the use of money, treated as an abstract commodity in and of itself, in effect an assumed embodiment of labor, allowed an evolution of thought and practice to emerge, which increasingly shifted the focus from relevant production, Locke's cultivation, to mere ownership mechanics and the pursuit of profit. Adam Smith. Adam Smith is often credited as one of the most influential economic philosophers in modern history. His work, while naturally based on the philosophical writings of many before him, is often considered a starting point for economic thought in the context of modern capitalism. Reaching maturity at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, Smith lived at a time where it could be argued that the inherent features of the capitalist mode of production were becoming ever more striking. Given the introduction of concentrated, centralized production factories and markets, as noted in 1776, Smith published his now world famous An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. 
Among many relevant observations, he appears to be the first to recognize the three principal categories of income at the time. A, profits, B, rents, and C, wages, and how they related to the main social classes of the period, A, capitalists, B, landlords, and C, laborers. It is worth noting that the role of landlords and rent, which is seldom discussed today in modern economic treatments, was a common point of focus then, since the pre-industrial systems was, were still largely agrarian highlighting the landlords, which later dissolved into the classification of simply owners in future market theories. Smith's most noted contribution to the philosophy of capitalism was his general advocation that even though individuals might act in a narrow, selfish manner on their personal behalf or on the behalf of the class or group to which they are a part, and even though conflict, both individual or class-based, seemed to be the result of these actions, there was what he called an invisible hand that secured a positive social outcome from singular, selfish, non-social intents. This concept was presented both in his works The Theory of Moral Sentiments and the Wealth of Nations, 